May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Don't think I didn't notice when I made that invitation for folks to go into Children's Chapel. Some of y'all may have put two and two together that this is Consecration Sunday. You heard that gospel. And you wonder what's coming next. I promise you can look in that gold book. This reading was picked long before, <laughs> long before. So don't worry. I mean, if you want to go sell all your stuff and come back and we have a conversation, we can do that. But we're really not going to talk about money today. Instead, we're going to talk about something that's maybe a little less controversial. We'll spend a little time talking about college football. De- depending on if you're Texas or A&M, yesterday might have been less controversial or more. If you're a Texas fan, what a game you saw. It was exciting. The atmosphere came up a little bit short. If you're an A&M, I'm, who am I kidding? If you're an A&M fan, you're still at home asleep because you had a crazy night last night. It, or if you're here, good on you. You came to give thanks for uh, Jimbo Fisher, maybe. I finally, my team won a football game, so I no longer hate college football for a week. Go Frogs, yeah, I see that. But this week, I also, on Tuesday, I got to go with my family. We took my mom to the college foot, or the Cotton Bowl Hall of Fame induction, right? The Cotton Bowl has a special place in my family's life, and that's a story for another day. Because we were there not for the Cotton Bowl stuff, but because of a man named Coach Bill Snyder. He was the longtime coach at Kansas State University. And so my folks are both from small town Kansas. My dad went to college and grad school at K-State. My mom, they were married, lived there in Manhattan with him. And so we went to be in the presence of Bill Snyder. This is an amazing story. If you don't know anything about college football, you probably ought to know that back in the 1980s, Sports Illustrated did a cover story called Futility U, and it was about K-State. They are the long-suffering of long-suffering programs, right? Like, I went two weeks without a win, and I was starting to get antsy, and I hated college football. K-State went three years without a win in the late 80s. And it's not like they had a bunch of wins before that. And so they, in 1988, they had yet another winless season, fired their coach, a lot of their players left. They had no money. They had terrible facilities. They had no players, really. They had no fan support. They were at risk of no longer being a part of the NCAA college athletics because you have to meet a threshold for fans and they would get hundreds of people so they called up this assistant coach at the university of iowa and said bill snyder have i got a deal for you can you imagine i saw a documentary this week i rewatched it called the miracle in manhattan and it talks about those early days And they have the athletic director up there, and he said his plan to get Bill Snyder was to just keep saying yes to literally everything that was asked until he could no longer ask any more questions. I guess it worked. But then this documentary also talked to some of those first players. You think about people who go on to play athletics in college, particularly NCAA football. They walked around their high schools like they were gods, probably. They ran their towns. I don't know what that says about us as a culture, and that's a different sermon again, but these young men had everything. And in comes this guy, and he says, hey, quarterback, hey, lineman, how would you like to move to Manhattan, Kansas? I've been to Manhattan, Kansas a lot of times. It's an okay town now. That's after a lot of investment. And all these players talked about when they set foot on that campus, 
They had worse facilities than they had in high school. They had fewer people in the stands than they did in high school. They had given up everything. To play at K-State, they gave up everything they knew, and they put their trust in someone that asked them to make a commitment. In our gospel today, St. Mark tells a story. And in this story, Jesus looks at this man and loved him. And Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. We all know this story. We put this story from Mark together with the parallels in the other gospel, and we give this character a name, the rich young ruler. His name says it all. He's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. Doesn't have to worry about money, doesn't have to worry about health, doesn't have to worry about power. He has it all. But he still comes to Jesus and asks for more. All the money, all the youth, all the power isn't enough. And I love how the gospel portrays this conversation. If someone like this comes to me and says, I have everything I need, tell me how to get more, I'm going to roll my eyes. Right? Let's just be honest. That's not what Jesus does. The gospel's clear in this interaction. The first thing Jesus does is Jesus looked at him. And this isn't a, a glancing look. The language here is staring intently. Jesus saw this rich young man. Jesus saw through this rich young man. And then it goes on. The next thing it says, and Jesus loved him. This is one of like two places in all the Gospels where it actually says Jesus loved someone. Right? We know Jesus loved everyone and we get that. But the fact that in this moment and in this encounter, the Gospel writers thought it important to say Jesus loved this rich young man. I think we have to pay attention to that. Because that sets up a hard conversation. Jesus looked and saw deep into this rich young man. Jesus loved this man, not because he was rich, not because he was young, not because he was powerful, but because he was made in the image of God and Jesus loved him. And so Jesus told him the truth. And that truth was hard to hear. Jesus told him the truth that his life, his wealth, his health, his power, and all that that affords him. That it has him twisted up in knots. It's actually holding him back. Jesus tells him the truth. That to get what he really desires, to get what he really needs, he has to give up what he already has. He has to give up a life determined by his position and his power. He has to give up a life determined by how much money he has. He has to give up a life determined by how he views himself above other people. He has to give up the fear of scarcity that will devour his soul. I think it's important to note that in this, right, Jesus isn't condemning this man to a life of poverty. 
Nowhere in here does it say, go sell all you own so you become poor too. It's not about that. But Jesus' request is so radically contrary to what the world thought back then. It's so radically contrary to what the world thinks today that we just focus on that bit, to give up everything, sell it all, give your money to the poor. We hear sermons about that. We hear stories about that. We focus on that, that we forget what Jesus actually ended with. He said, when you've done that, when you've given up that which controls you, when you've given up whatever is holding you back, when you've given that up, then your life can really start because Jesus extends the invitation, come and follow me. Now, I would probably be labeled a heretic if I said Coach Schneider was close to Jesus. Although my folks would really agree with that statement. But it's close. Maybe not too close. Coach Schneider once gave an interview in which he talked about his recruiting process, and he talked about how early on he would have to go to these recruits and say, I've got nothing. We got no facilities, we got no money, we have no fans. But what I can give you is myself. He would tell his recruits, if you come here, I will love you, I will trust you, I will inspire you, and we will try to do something great. And the crazy thing is, if you know the story, is it started to work. K-State started to win a lot of football games. Ten years after they had no money and hired this coach from Iowa, they were within minutes of playing for the national championship. They had a lot of success. At first, a couple folks bought in. Success was slow, but folks learned they could trust Coach Schneider, and folks learned that Coach Schneider loved them. So more and more recruits started lining up for the chance to play. One of those was a high school buddy of mine. He was an all-state linebacker, all dist, all everything. He had it all. Every college you can think of was lining up and would show up at our school to try to talk to this guy. He had everything. Then one day he met Coach Schneider. And I remember him sharing this conversation he had with Coach Schneider. And the thing that stuck out to him, the thing that sticks out to me, is Coach Schneider didn't tell him how great he was. Coach Schneider didn't tell him, you already have everything and we need it. The message Coach Schneider left for him is that if you give up just being an all-state football player, you can become a K-State football player. If you give up everything that you think you have, you can become a part of something so much bigger. Jesus in our gospel today invites this rich young ruler to give up everything. To give up those things that give him control, to give up those things in which he finds value, to give up those things that are holding him back. But he invites him to more. He invites him to come and follow. He invites him to become a disciple to become a part of a family, to become a part of something that would end up changing the world. And Jesus extends us that same invitation. Now in a little bit, we're going to have the opportunity to bring pledge cards forward. We're going to have an opportunity to commit to God 
what we think we can support financially this place. And maybe God is whispering something in your ear about that. Or maybe God is whispering something in your ear about something else you need to let go of. A grudge. A sense of control. Something that's holding you back. And maybe one of those is a relationship with money. And maybe what we do today and what we begin through this process of stewardship can help you transform that. But all of that is between you and God. It's what God is telling you, and it's how you respond to that. And we don't respond because it's what we think the world wants. We don't respond because people come up here and tell us it's what we should do. We respond because it's an invitation from Jesus. It's an invitation to give up something. Maybe it's an invitation to give up everything. Because we know, we trust, we believe Jesus is serious. That when we give up that which holds us back, we're finally free to follow him. Amen.